And I looked up <coughs> over the altar in this beautiful crucifix corpus with Jesus hanging on it, looking down at me. And it's almost as if he said, I'm looking for you. I'm looking at you. I want you to be with me. I'm going to record a little short message just to test this thing. If you recall the last time we did this, the playback sounded like the uh, little munchkins. I don't know what caused that, but it's evidently playing much too fast or slow to get a good reproduction. So I'm going to try to do it now again and see what happens. loud in this little microphone over here so consequently if it's recording anything I should be able to rewind this tape and play it back and see what I have said if it's at all possible so let's put a little more on here and then give it a try one two three Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is going to be a tape that's done kind of impromptu without much guidance or review. It won't be edited. It'll be just taped and played. That'll be about it. <clears throat> there won't be any backups erasures and things of that nature because uh, I'm not too fond of having to do that. But I do want to tell a little story uh, as we go along about some things in my life that stand out as things that happened that I remember so well. Some of them I don't remember because I was too small, but they were related to me by my family. It seems that my mother always said that it was a cold day in May, May the 19th, 1924, when I was born. She had to have a fire in the fireplace, and all homes in those days were equipped with a fireplace probably in each room which were fired by black coal. Coal was plentiful in those days and still is, up and down the eastern seaboard, all the way from the West Virginia mountains down to the North Carolina mountains. And it's still a very useful fuel in industry. Not so much for home heating anymore, but it's a you just see the trains go by day after day hauling that coal. So it was evidently a cold day. And I was born on West Lee Street, which is now bounds the number one post office on the south side and it is part of uh, the complex there where the post office is today. The house is gone, the street is still there, but it was called Lee Street probably after General Robert E. Lee. So many of our southern streets in this town particularly are named after officers of the Confederate in the Revolutionary War. They named me William Russell Gaffney. 
I imagine, a second because I was named after my dad's favorite brother, William Russell Gaffney, who died at a rather young age, probably in his late 30s, due to uh, some complications from an operation. But my father was so fond of him that he decided to name his only son for that man. I don't know how long we stayed on Lee Street because I was just an infant. But thinking back now, we must have moved at one time or other over on Converse Street, which is over up from Lee Street towards town, and lived there for quite some time. And this was in 1924. 25, 26, just getting into what was known then as the big boom. Everything was going great, business was good, and people making money, and my Uncle Russ and my daddy formed this sale, land sales company, and for some reason, I don't know, we headed out to Florida. I guess they were going to develop land and <clears throat> auction it off and try to make some money. They were both adventurers in their lifetime, no doubt about that. But in 1927-28, you probably have read in the history books or you will continue to read in the history books about the crash of 29-28 where everybody that had any money lost it. <laughs> they had it invested in things they thought they were going to get rich, and they found out that they were just going to get poorer and poorer. So consequently, I guess we headed back to Spartanburg. Luckily, my father had a little house down on South Converse Street that we were able to move into. And then my Aunt Mildred Drake, my father's sister uh, she went in with my mother and they rented a larger home and just kind of for economic reasons moved the both families in together my mother's family my father's family of me and three sisters and Aunt Mildred's family of five boys and a girl. Might have been four boys and a girl, but anyway, it's a large family. So by sharing the same roof and the same expenses, we were able to make it through those times. If I seem to ramble from time to time, it's because I said in the beginning, I'm doing this for no notes, and just kind of recall on the top of the head and put things together and see if they come out right. But during those times, we were all living as a family unit. All the men in the family that were old enough worked, and the, the women operated the home. My Aunt Mildred Drake, who we called a Big Mama, and my mother, whom everybody called Nanny, were there all day and they decided to go into a little enterprise making sandwiches at home and selling them through the stores, the drug stores downtown. They did that, started right there at the house and we had this black man, a wonderful human being who worked in the family and he would take those sandwiches fresh every day. Go downtown, we had maybe about five drugstores that had soda fountains, and he would put those sandwiches with their permission in the stores and let them sit for a day. If they didn't sell, he'd pick them up and bring them some more. It was kind of on a consignment basis. 
And the business grew and grew because they were sandwiches were so good. They made them fresh, fresh breads, fresh ingredients. Made about four or five different varieties. And wrapped them attractively and put them on the on the soda fountains. And they took a little commission of the of the what they sold. Or maybe gave the uh, druggist, the drugstore operator, a little commission for what he sold. I don't know exactly exactly how that worked. Uh, however, the business became a little enterprise. They didn't make a whole lot of money, but it gave a lot of people in the family an idea. Francis Drake, who was a born go-getter type businessman, my father being an adventurer and was willing to try anything that might work as far as uh, doing anything of any accomplishment, they decided to uh, form a little company and start making these commercially on a larger scale. Well, they had to go where the business was, and it seems that Oklahoma and Texas, in that area, were still doing pretty good business. And they heard about a, a chain of drugstores called Steinberg Drugs in the Tulsa, Oklahoma City area. And this is the way it was related to me. They went down there and opened up a shop, one in Tulsa and one in Oklahoma City, making these sandwiches. And with the idea of putting them on the market through the beginning of what we know now as chain stores and in these drug and fountain stores. Steinberg, according to what was told me, had maybe 50 stores in those two towns. And evidently they got the contract to make all the sandwiches for them. And that presented a pretty good way to start. It grew from that to more. And I think they did quite well financially. And even though things were still tough, the depression was just beginning to wind down. Everybody made a living. They rented uh, places that would accommodate a lot of the kinfolk. Uh, I know in one case in West Virginia, when we went up there, they had Mildred and Boris and Men and Warren and several outsiders and people that came move up, moved up to the family. They would rent a large building and uh, everybody lived in it and worked in the sandwich business. And they had four or five delivery cars. And each person would put their sandwiches out each day and work their routes, so to speak, to keep the business going, and it grew and grew and grew. They operated under the name of Drake's Flowers. Drake's, I beg your pardon. I'm in the flower business now. Uh, Drake's Sandwiches. And became, they became very well known in the territories that we were in. And surprisingly, just a few years ago, the Drake franchise of sandwiches closed here in Spartanburg because there was no need for everything was vending machines then, and there's no need for that sort of service. So after a stint in Oklahoma, we decided to go to West Virginia. Why, I don't know. But we went to uh, Tulsa, to uh, Huntington did the same thing there. And I became, over those years, I don't know much about it, but I was, I have a little picture hanging on the wall out here at the house right now of me when I was about three years old. And I think that was made on South Converse Street before we headed out on these various missions. And I uh, found out later that we were wondering the name of the doctor that might have delivered me. And my sister Minnie said it was a Dr. Wilson, a well-known doctor here in Spartanburg at that time. So we went on up to uh, West Virginia. I became of school age when we were in uh, Huntington. And uh, six years old, 
and we put me in the my family put me in the first grade there in a school called Sims School your typical neighborhood school with a dirt yard big oak trees and I think it must have been maybe his grade from one through eight and then high school was nine ten eleven I went to just the first grade there because we came back to Spartanburg my daddy had just been appointed a county man later the long time Democratic senator from South Carolina, Olin B. Johnston, of quite some political fame. We got through those years because my dad was steadily, steadily employed as a magistrate, and uh, I think the Samus business continued to operate through members of the family. and. We went on to uh, I've lost some continuity here, but here I am back. Um, just to bring us up to date. I found out some things today about my family. As you know, I told you we I had three sisters, and I found out today their ages, which they would not mind me saying, because all of them deceased except one. My sister Mildred was born in 1909. My sister Minnie was born in 1910 and a half. And my sister Margie Stallings, who was the late wife of late Colonel Stallings, in 1917 and I was born in 1924. Now we're talking about a period of time now, about 1931 or that area, when I was in the second grade at what is known now as Pine Street School and still stands today completely refurbished and beautiful and it'll stand there for many, many years. I was one of the, in one of the first classes at went into that school and went there until I went to the high school in the eighth grade at Spartanburg High School. We had 11 grades in those days. We went four years, eight, nine, ten, eleven to Spartan High. That has been completely refurbished over the years and is now as a county office building. So I'm very fortunate to live in a town where I went to school and they're both are still standing in probably the best school buildings existing in the county. Uh, very lucky to be there. I, getting into my school years, I wouldn't say that I was an extremely good student, only in things that I was fond of. The things that I didn't like I didn't do too well. I passed, but I didn't like them. And it seems that I was definitely not an athlete. I tried to play a little B-team football, as we called it in those days. Played a couple of games for Spartan High. Just about got killed. Decided that was not for me. And then I played on the baseball team and did fairly well. I had a little talent for baseball. It didn't require uh, a lot of strength and stamina and guts to play baseball. A little finesse and a little talent, which I seem to have as a person. However, I never did materialize in that either <clears throat> because I really wasn't that interested in it. I played a little bit what we call sandlot baseball. I like to pitch and like to play first base. Um, then I found out what I really liked was the sciences in school and the music along with it. I had a friend, a very close friend in school named Robert Cecil and I were in the 
hall one day looking at the bulletin boards outside the band room and uh, they said that they had a couple of instruments that they would lend students just to learn how to play them if they'd play in the band. And you got an extra half credit. So that sounded pretty enticing to me and to Bob because that gave us an opportunity to pick up a half credit and try something a little different. So we went in that afternoon and talked to a gentleman named Mr. Vernon Balknight, who was the new kind of young band director there at Spartan High. And in fact, hadn't much of a band prior to that. And he said, I have two instruments over there if you want to look at them. And we said, OK, let's see. Uh, that one there with the three valves on it is called a trumpet or a cornet. And the other one with three valves, but a lot of curly cues and tubing and everything is called a French horn. So I said, well, Bob says, which one appeals to you? I said, I don't like that one with all the tubing curled around. I like this other thing that's a little smaller than me. So we chose our instruments. I took the cornet. Bob took the French horn. And we started off in the, uh, what you would call the, even though we were in the beginning of the, beginning of the late first year of high school, we had to start kind of the bottom and take some private lessons and become part of the band. Not braggingly so, but Bob and I both had a talent for that. We advanced right along and became prominent members of the band and later on were in various school music activities like we had the uh, school brass sextet who we performed for the various schools and played at the governor's mansion and things of that nature. It became quite well known as a kind of uh, after school music group. The quintet, if I recall correctly, involved Bob Cecil, Howard Pettit, Paul Skelton, Kenneth Brown, John Gorminsky, and myself. A little background on these gentlemen who are still living, I think, most of them. Bob is retired music professor from Hope College in Holland, Michigan. Howard Pettit is a prominent lawyer down in the Walhalla, South Carolina. Paul Skelton was co-owner of a large furniture store here in Spartanburg, which is still operating under the name of Skelton's. Ben Brown is deceased. He was a lawyer and lived in Pickens, and he's deceased. And then there's John Gorminsky. He lives in Atlanta. I don't know if he's still living or not and myself, but it was a lot of fun to be with those men. We got to travel a lot, got honored at so many different occasions, and it was well worth the while. To back up just a moment, I kept calling that a quintet. It was later enlarged to be a sextet, and I did name the proper people in it, involving one, two, three, four, five, six people if I'm correct, was Bob, Howard, Paul, me, Kent Brown, and Glaminski. So that is six. Just wanted to back up and make that little correct because I did go through school and I learned to count up past that figure without any problem. I don't know how to do this without using the pronoun I so much since it is my story, basically. So you'll have to pardon me because I don't know of any other way to word it. But I do want to tell these things as I recall them happening to me over this period of time. 
I guess my musical talent was exemplified at an early age. It, back in uh, Pine Street School in about the third grade, they wanted to organize a Spartanburg City School rhythm band. I'm sure you recall those rhythm bands where people beat on sticks and rang bells and things of that nature and played with a little recording. <clears throat> so <clears throat> they had tryouts, and I don't know who encouraged me to do that, probably my father, or maybe my teacher, Miss Anderson over there in, in Pine Street, who took a liking to my uh, abilities along those lines. And Margaret Mullinax was a wonderful teacher of music in the city schools. So they had tryouts, and it seems that I won the audition for to conduct the All City Rhythm Band. We played in the gymnasium at the Spartanburg High School. And it seems that the colors at Pine Street at that time were green and white. So my mother made me a little, what was known as a frock tail, kind of a split tail formal suit out of green satin. <laughs> I bet that was funny looking. And I had a baton, and I beat this rhythm. Just beat it rotely, beat it rotely. Steady, steady, beat it. And, uh, the people in the rhythm band beat their little sticks and the bells and the chimes and things like that. And if I recall, we played something from the Nutcracker. And uh, it was one of my earliest memories of being actually involved in that sort of thing as, as a musical show, so to speak. But my musical talents were, as I say, exemplified at those ages, and then I grew up and started playing the trumpet. It wasn't long before I realized where my leanings were musically. We, I enjoyed playing in the symphony and in the uh, high school orchestra and in the concert band. I didn't like marching band at all. I didn't like playing football games. And later on, I enjoyed uh, playing ice shows, circuses, and things of that nature for the experience and for the challenge as a player, and made some money doing that in those days also as these traveling shows would come through town. It was uh, quite an experience and a growing experience for me musically. It seemed that I practiced a lot in those days, sometimes in the summertime, uh, two, three, four hours a day. But as I said, my leanings were obvious in that it was the big band sounds of the 40s and the smaller jazz ensembles that seemed to attract me and displayed my abilities to a little better advantage. We went on and played, and I played locally when I was in high school and in college. I got to play my first gig, so to speak, with a big band, with Lewis Clayton and his band, which consisted of uh, four saxes, four brass, and three rhythm. It was a good band. Got a lot of work. Played locally. Greenville, Hendersonville, Charlotte, Spartanburg, places of that nature. And uh, made a little money too. Sometimes as much as uh, four or five dollars for a job. And I played my first experience in a 
trumpet section consisting of O'Neill Landrum, who was a retired, very good trumpeter from the Paul Whitemore Orchestra of some fame. And he was from Packlet, so he came back home to retire, but still played. And Ross Holmes, <coughs> whom I know today as a friend and a fellow musician, Ross played the second chair book in the orchestra, and I played third the best I could. Uh, there's an experience that I recall and talk to Ross about it quite often. The first time I went to a rehearsal over at Lewis's, they gave me the third book, and they said, okay, we're going to play uh, number 348 or something like that. And uh, opened my page at 348, and it was a stock arrangement. It had a lot of DCs and repeats and uh, things of that nature, which I was about that familiar with. And so I played right on through real softly, and I was through much quicker than the rest of them. And I found out that I had not played any of the repeats or the DCs or any of that stuff. So I was through uh, much quicker than most everybody else, which gave everybody a laugh. And then Oss and those people began to teach me exactly what to do. As time went on, of course, I learned a little more about playing the horn and began to get more work. And over the years, developed a reputation as a pretty fair trumpet player, particularly on a local level. And uh, played with other bands, the Furman Neal Band and Orchestra in Greenville, and uh, Jerry Bass, and a lot of the local bands and had an opportunity to play from time to time with quite a number of other bands uh, that came through town. The Larry Clinton Band, uh, the Dean Hudson Band, which I later went off with, I'll tell you about that. The Stan Alexander and the Billy Kanoff. Larry Clinton, I don't know if I mentioned him or not. But all of those people played one nighter with uh, the famous Harry James Orchestra in Greenville as a fill-in. And so I had a, quite a varied musical experience to be just a uh, local fellow here in Spartanburg. <clears throat> I played for many years from that time on and uh, actually quit playing professionally or to any extent in about the mid 70s, late 70s. Uh, might have played a little bit after that, but I'm not sure. Our son Russ studied trumpet and became quite an accomplished trumpet player and still is today. And he works with a very good band in, out of Greensboro, North Carolina. And they seem to get some real good work, make some money, and I'm sure he's enjoying every minute of it just like I did. I had visions of being a professional trumpet player after I got out of the service and I gave it a try. But I realized having already two children that it was not going to be a very feasible thing to do any traveling or trying to pursue a musical career and devote that much time to it. I played with some good bands. I remember the summer of between my freshman and sophomore year at Walford I auditioned for a band called Dean Hudson which was a very well-known band in the South and East particularly. And I auditioned in uh, Greenville and he said he was going to go on about a six or seven week tour up and down the East Coast to go down to Pensacola, Miami, uh, Jacksonville, some of, the, some of these towns, towns we played in for uh, you know a week or so in nightclubs 
and up to Atlantic City, Wrightsville Beach. So uh, we went up and down the East Coast playing these uh, jobs, and I met a lot of nice musicians and uh, learned to play in that band pretty well, became a part of it for that brief length of time. Dean wanted me to stay with him and go on the road with him permanently, but I had obligations at home, and I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. And uh, the World War was, draft notices were going out about a millions, and it didn't look too promising for anybody, particularly at my age, being a sophomore in college. But those were enjoyable years, and I had a lot of good experience, and met a lot of good musicians and good friends. And I recently ordered a CD of the Hudson Band recorded back in 44. I was not with them in 44. I think probably the last time I played with them was in 41 or early 42. And uh, some guys on there, I remember, Jimmy Farr, a very fine trumpet player, who later went with the Woody Herman Band for a while. And uh, there was a piano player that was from, I believe, Charlotte, North Carolina, whom uh, uh, everybody liked. A very fine player. <coughs> Seems that he died a tragic death, like choking to death on some food or something at a restaurant. But uh, those things I remember, those people were good musicians, and sober, and hard workers, and uh, they, they enjoyed playing their music, and they played it very well. So other than those things, and continuing to play locally, weekends, uh, most every weekend we had some sort of band together. One band I played with for 10 years at the same club every Friday and Saturday night. That was over at the Elks Club in Greenville. So that's what you call an extended engagement. But other than that, I played locally, enjoyed it, made some money occasionally, and kept up my friendship with my fellow musicians and develop my talents over the years. When I was younger, I had a, a cousin named Juanita Wilkins who was a piano teacher and a voice teacher. <coughs> Lived over on Glendalen Avenue. And my father talked to her about giving me some piano lessons. And <coughs> so I went from my piano lessons, but she got involved in my voice, I don't think I ever learned any piano. And she had me singing in local churches, all the churches. I was a member of the Southside Baptist Church at that time, and I was about maybe 11 years old or so, and she had me singing on Sunday, and solos and all these things. I don't know where she was headed with that, but it wasn't long until I got out of it. And uh, she was running my voice anyway at that time, being it was such a young voice and uh, overworking it. And so we gave up on that pretty quick. It got so bad that in the annual one year, they put up my picture in there like they still do, but they put a little note underneath each picture and it says, Russ Gaffney, the one gal guy who comes to school every morning with a horn and no books. Now, what does that tell you about my studious abilities? Those are very tumultuous years, things which were happening so fast, particular people in my age groups that were in college or seniors in high school because the world was going to definitely going to be at war and it looked like everybody was sooner or later going to have to do something militarily. Uh, for a little change, uh, 
several of us guys decided to go to, back in 1939, late summer 39, out to Duncan Park to a ball game. We had a local baseball team here called the Spartanburg Peaches, who were class B ball, pretty decent uh, baseball, out at beautiful Duncan Park as it is today. And so a bunch of us guys decided to go to the ball game for didn't have anything else to do and didn't have any money to go anywhere much. Figured we might get a hot dog and uh, a Coke. And by the way, Walter Demopoulos owns the, owned the franchise for the baseball team. And he also ran a restaurant downtown. And he would sell his hot dogs five for a dollar. And uh, couldn't hardly beat that. So you get a bag of hot dogs and everybody divide them. And you get a Coke and you've got your little refreshment at the, at the ball game. Well, we noticed... Uh, quite a few young girls over there all sitting by themselves and some of them knew us and some of them didn't or vice versa so we went over and started to as young guys will talking to them we were about 15 16 years old talking to those girls and uh, eventually sat down with them and uh, uh, there was one girl there that just fascinated. She was a little quiet, but she was just different. She seemed different from the rest of them to some extent, and maybe it was because I was so attracted to her immediately. But that wound up to be, after I inquired who she was, they said, well, that's Margaret Hughes, Margie Hughes, lives over on Pendleton Avenue. And I said, well, uh, what do you know about her? I said, I don't know. Uh, she's a very nice girl, comes from a good family. And uh, so I went over there and sat down and introduced myself. And we talked a little bit. And it seems that uh, she had just gotten back from Camp Pinnacle. She went up there every year as a kind of a counselor. And... Uh, so we talked about our summer that we are just about over with and what we were going to do. And uh, I was immediately attracted to her. Well, I didn't see her anymore hardly until uh, later that year. And then next Christmas time, uh, it was customary for some of these young ladies to give dances. And Margie gave one out at the... Um, I guess at the Athalia Club or the Country Club or the Woman's Club, one of those clubs. And uh, they sent out invitations for uh, guys to bring girls. <clears throat> so I got an invitation to take uh, a friend of the family, a friend of Margie's named Toddy Page. And uh, by the way, later married the, uh, uh, had a son named the Lee Atwater, the political guy back during the early campaigns for the presidency. And <clears throat> she, I said, well, I'll take Toddy. I know Toddy. We're friends. So I picked Toddy up and we went to the dance. And you know, had Mr. Julian and his uh, jukeboxes and his uh, big band music and the jitterbugs and all that stuff going so it was enjoyable and I was always taught so to speak that if you invited to a, a, a girl's dance that you make sure that you dance with her before the evening's over so I wanted to dance with Margie so bad but I was trying to get up enough nerve to break on her so finally I did and I went over and asked her, for, could I break? And she said, yes. I said, uh, you look real pretty tonight. She says, I said, I've been looking at you. And I said, I remember meeting you at the ball games. And 
Oh, she, Margie smells so delicious, and she had on a a black or blue square cut neck dress with lace or rickrack run through it, and she was just absolutely gorgeous. I danced with her two or three times after that and began to nuzzle up a little bit against that cheek and smell that wonderful <laughs> smell. It's just, it's hard to describe when you're so attracted to someone so immediately. <clears throat> so that must have been around 1939 or during the year of uh, 40. <clears throat> Margie graduated from uh, high school in the class of 40 and uh, she was a year ahead of me and I went on to uh, my I graduated in 41 and went to uh, Wofford College as a freshman in 41 and that Christmas Margie and I had been dating a lot that year and she asked me if I would like to go to midnight mass well I didn't know that she was really Catholic I didn't know what she was we never had discussed religion and I don't know she might have known that I was a Southside Baptist, I don't know that, but uh, she asked me if I'd like to go to midnight mass, and I said, well, what does that involve? She says, well, we go at midnight to church, and we have what we call mass. <clears throat> Last about an hour and a half with the singing and everything. And then we would usually go to my mother's house. She has her friends in, and they'll have uh, sandwiches and eggnog, and uh, a little get together after mass, and then go home. So I got to thinking that this, this must be a great opportunity for what one might call a late date. Go early, midnight, eating sandwiches at 2 a.m. That that was just too good to turn down. But the most amazing thing about this whole thing is that when I walked in that church, the first time I'd ever been in it, and as you know, Catholic churches, like most churches, are beautifully decorated at Christmas time with the tree and the lights. And I was just completely overwhelmed. I think the Holy Spirit grabbed me and would not let go. I'd forgotten all about the, the ham sandwiches and the eggnog and the late dates and everything. I was involved in that church so deeply from that very moment that I couldn't hardly believe what was happening. And I looked up <clears throat> over the altar and this beautiful crucifix corpus with Jesus hanging on it, looking down at me. And it's almost as if he said, I'm looking for you. I'm looking at you. I want you to be with me. It's almost audible. I felt it so deeply. So, from that day on, nothing against my friends at the Southside Baptist my folks went there that was my church I grew up in that church sang in the choir active in the youth activities and those sorts of things but here, here I am a 17 year old boy now <clears throat> or 16 year old boy and to be touched that much by anything I never experienced it so I, from that day on, I never went back into my church again, and I started going to St. Paul's. 
sometimes I would go with Margie. And if she was not going to the same mass I was going to, I would go by myself. But I never missed. And over the years now, of many, many years of Catholicism, it's been the same thing. A true dedication to the faith. And it was that influence that started that night who led not only me into the church, later on my father, my mother, one of my sisters, and we had more or less of a Catholic family grow out of that one relationship with that lovely young lady at St. Paul's that Christmas Eve. Since those days of my conversion under my mother and father and my sister, there have been other conversions rooting from that same beginning. I had uh, two nieces and a brother-in-law later come into the church. So we wound up being more or less of a Catholic family, all stemming from that one visit to Midnight Mass with the lady who is now my wife. Record and play. Right. Now it's ready to go? I mean, are you ready to go or do I need to rewind it or something? I don't know how far to rewind it. Okay, we'll just be ready to go. Okay, we're going to talk about three times. Yep that we went through doing college years, doing the beginning of the war years, and I'll try to tell you a little bit about the situation as it was. I was going to Wofford in my freshman class. Your mother, Margie, graduated uh, a year earlier than I high school. She was uh, a few months older than I, and the way the graduation years worked out, and the school years worked out, she finished a few months before I did, so consequently she was out of high school. On the calendar year, a year before me, she went to work with her daddy at the city news agency and took some courses at uh, business college. And I continued my studies for my senior year at Spartanburg High School. She was able to date me. We were able to date one another, I should say, during that time. And it was very tiring and troublesome time. Every day, you would see headlines in the paper, the number of men that were being drafted. I had my draft notice. Every young, able-bodied man had a draft notice. It was just a matter of time until when one got drafted. Now, to get drafted meant that you were called into the service and you had no choice of what you did. I considered several aspects. I thought that Going into the service as a, a person in the infantry, a foot soldier, was not a very good idea because I didn't like the idea of maybe crawling around in the mud, 
carrying a nine pound rifle to serve my country when there are other ways of doing it. So I kind of discarded that idea. And even though it's glamorous to be a United States Marine, one of the few, as they like to call it, that they need just a few good men. Well, I didn't want to be a few of those good men. So then it boiled down to the Navy, which I was not that fond of boats and water anyway. And if they had only one choice, that would be to go to the Air Corps. I didn't know anything about airplanes. I'd had a $2 ride over Spartanburg one time. I think my dad took me on that little Sunday afternoon ride just for fun. And I'd never really been gung-ho about flying, particularly. But I felt like that might be the best way to serve my country, if I could qualify. And by qualifying, that meant that I had to have a certain IQ, a certain physical standing and would have to undergo some pretty heavy things to qualify to fly. So I applied for a flight school. That meant that I had to apply and wait and see if they could find a place for me in training. So I did. And in the meantime, they sent me up to South Dakota to a radio operator's bombing school, which would have meant I'd been a radio operator on a bomber if I didn't qualify or did in time to get into flight school. So, as luck would have it, I did qualify physically, mentally, and met all the requirements for flight school, except they didn't have any opening at that time. So I completed the training at the radio school and was prepared to go as a radio operator bomber. And about a week before I was to leave, my orders came through that I had been called into uh, flight school. What a break. Quite an exciting day. So, I had already planned to come home to marry your mother in June. So those orders had to be canceled because I couldn't come home then. So we wound up, she coming to Salt Lake City because I could get a few days off and we would be married there, which seemed to be okay. Not the best, but at least we'd be married. So she flew 
No, I beg your pardon, she didn't fly. Couldn't get a place on an airplane. She rode a train to Salt Lake City. We were married in June of 1943. Our father had a storied life. To those he met, he may have appeared larger than life. From simple beginnings in Spartanburg, he went on to become one of the most recognized and sought-out trumpet players in the Southeast. During World War II, he trained countless men to be pilots who went on to fly in defense of our country. As a business owner, he was well-respected in the community, due in part to his meticulous attention to detail, impeccably honest business practices, and shrewd financial management. While he was proud, and rightfully so, he never boasted about his accomplishments. Rather, he chose to praise the accomplishments of those around him. I have often compared the life of our father to that of Jimmy Stewart in Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. Playing the trumpet was his passion, and playing around the country was his dream. But his father's ailing health and the realization that he had a young family to support set the course of his life in a different direction. While music, aviation, and his business were outward signs of his success, his real passion was his family and his church. Our father was completely devoted to our mother and to each of us, his children. We grew up in an environment filled with love, praise, support, and understanding. Listening to Dad talk about his life and his family in his own words brings back a plethora of emotions and memories. From humble beginnings, Russ Gaffney set the bar high for his family, friends, and anyone he encountered. These many years after his death, his words continue to inspire all of us to live a fruitful life filled with love, praise, support, and understanding. We love you, Dad. Thank you.